Sunday school, Sunday school at Grace Baptist Church. Today we're going to deal with some questions answered. Some questions answered. The the scripture often speaks of God's people being reminded of certain things that they've been taught previously because of the great importance always of always being mindful of the truth of God's word. We need to be reminded. We need always to be mindful of the truth of God's word. Peter says this in his second letter to Christians. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. We have the holy prophets, and we have the apostles. We, here at Grace Baptist Church, are a sovereign grace congregation of believers who preach and teach the gospel of the grace of the God. And therefore, we teach the doctrines of grace as led by the spirit of truth, even the Holy Spirit of God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. You have heard recently from this pulpit both the pastor and myself, dealing with teachings concerning the sovereign grace of God, predestination, election, total depravity, irresistible grace, particular redemption, eternal life, eternal condemnation, progressive sanctification, the perfect, inerrant scriptures, and the absolute perfection of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is the express image of God the Father. This Jesus is the presently reigning Lord of heaven and earth, which is the universe. All things were created by him, And for him, and in him, all things are held together. Jesus Christ is the main subject in all the scripture. For the Christian, Jesus Christ must be all and in all. And of course, we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ along with his second coming, when he will return to judge all of humanity, setting all things in order before subjecting himself to the Father, as he always has, that God may be all in all. And may I add this, we do not deal with what we preach and teach in a surface way. But we go as far as the Holy Spirit of God leads us. And by necessity, that includes a great deal of time spent on references to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. You have recently heard from this pulpit that God saves only elect or chosen human beings. Of course, with that being true, Christ's death on the cross would by necessity be applied only to and been done only for the elect. This is called limited atonement. 
or as I prefer, particular redemption. Now to our title, Some Questions Answered. When we say Christ died only for the elect and God saves only the elect, people invariably come up with scripture that they say dispels that position. Let's look at some of those verses and present the truth. This past week, the pastor referred to 1 Timothy 2, where Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote, and may I read from a bit more literal translation, the scripture refers to God our Savior, who wills all human beings to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The pastor correctly referred to all kinds of human beings, men in the King James Version, rather than all without exception. How are we to understand why we would come to that conclusion? The scriptures answer the question. Listen very closely now. Apply those God-indwelt minds even a mind of Christ. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and knew well the hostility of the Jews to the idea of Gentiles as inclusive members in the people of God. Timothy, to whom this letter was sent, from which we just quoted, was also aware of that prejudice. Because his father was a Greek, a Gentile. His mother was a Jew. Acts 16.1 Both Paul and Timothy, led by the Spirit of God, knew well what the words all men, all human beings were referring to. I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to read into the second chapter as well. I'm going to read verses, uh, chapter 1, 8 through verses, chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord from the Thessalonians has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. That is a a wide expanse of knowledge going forth. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Now what's interesting about the fact that he says we goes back to the first verse, because indeed, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were writing this letter to the church of the Thessalonians. For they themselves, and that is referring back to Macedonia and Achaia and in every place, for they themselves uh, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's speaking to Gentiles. And to wait for his son from heaven, heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. For you yourselves know, brethren, you Gentiles know, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Again, he's talking to Gentiles. Who was, was it that caused this conflict? Conflict. I'm having trouble this morning. Sorry about that. 
the conflict, and you can go back to Acts 17 to uh, confirm this, the conflict was from Jews. It was Jews who interceded themselves in this thing and caused a problem when Paul was reaching the Gentiles. For our exhortation, not from deceit or uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our heart. Not as pleasing men. He wasn't there to please the Jews. He wasn't there to please the Gentiles. He was there to please God. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nurse cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you, you Gentiles, not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. We preach to you Gentiles the gospel of God. You are witnesses. And God, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Gentiles believed. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father his own children, that you would walk, excuse me, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you, who calls you, God who calls Gentiles into his kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The inward call of regeneration given to the Gentiles. Now listen up. This is going to answer this all men question, this all human beings question. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. Speaking of Jewish churches. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, the Gentiles, just as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they, listen, this is our answer. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men. They are contrary to all human beings. Now, they weren't contrary to themselves, folks. So what is he talking about when he's talking about all men, all human beings? Listen to the very next statement. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. These Jews were contrary. They were opposed to the idea of Gentiles being included in the people of God being saved. This is what is meant by all men, all kinds of human beings both Jews and Gentiles, all kinds of people. So as always, these Jews, to fill up of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. I certainly hope you followed that. Paul and Timothy knew well this way of speaking when they spoke about 
all men, all human beings. It is a reference to the Jews and the Gentiles, all kinds of people. Now reading, we're going to go right back to a, another book that includes uh, Timothy. I'm going to take that back. I'm getting off the track here. I'm sorry. I've already finished that. Some people may say, well, that might be true. What I've just said, that might be true, uh, preacher. But how do we deal with 1 John 2, 2? Let's look there. 1 John 2, 2. I've just made the statement that uh, all men is a reference to all kinds of men, both Jews and Gentiles. And then, boom, as I said, folks will come up with things that they say explode what I've just said. 1 John 2, 2. And he himself, that's speaking of Christ, is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. My goodness, how in the world do you deal with that? Christ is the satisfaction, not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. Well, believe me. The Apostle John knew exactly the same thing that the Apostle Paul knew. They were both led by the Holy Spirit of God. As Paul was sent to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, so John and James and Peter were sent to the circumcised, the Jews. Listen to, don't turn there now for time's sake, but I want you to listen to the book of Galatians. I want to prove what I just said. Galatians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. But from those who seem to be something, and this is Paul writing, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favor to no man. For those who seemed to be something adding, added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw the gospel for the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, had been committed to me as for the circumcised to Peter. Peter went to the Jews. Paul went to the Gentiles. For he worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised, but, excuse me, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit of Christ working in Peter, the Holy Spirit of Christ working in Paul. Look at verse 9 now, listen to it, excuse me. And when James... Cephas, which is a reference to Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we to the Gentiles, and they to them circumcised. Who was John writing to when he made that statement in 1 John 2.2? 2. He was speaking to the Jews. You cannot deny that. I just proved that from the word of God. So when he says Christ is the satisfaction for our sins, he's talking about the Jews. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. All kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles. And those verses should shed great light on what John was saying. Well, preacher, 
we can see Christ died for everyone. You just said so. Uh, no, no. I can assure you John is not saying that as his gospel account makes clear in numerous places, uh, he's not saying that Christ died for everybody. As with Paul, every God-sent man must say, I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. And I'm saying that to you about myself today. As that may appear that Christ died for everybody, we're going to look at some other things that the same writer who was led by the same Holy Spirit says in reference to particular redemption, which makes null and void, which disproves any claim to universal redemption, or in other words, that Christ died for all humanity. In John chapter 17, Christ praying to God the Father Verses 6, 9, and 20, we read this. Christ says to the Father, I have manifested your name to the human beings whom you have given me out of the world. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which would include Gentiles, folks, the whole world, all kinds of people. But specifically speaking, who is Christ dying for? Who is Christ saving? those that were given to him by God, not every person without exception. In the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in the Bible written also by the Apostle John, we see in chapter 5, verse 9, as the saints sing to Christ, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, he speaks to the Lamb of God out of every tribe, out of every tongue, and people, and nation. As Christ said, his people were taken out of the world to be saved. For clarity, that is impossible to refute. I want us to turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm going to be reading some, the gospel of John chapter 10. I'm going to be reading some verses that cannot be any more clear. We've got to consider the whole counsel of God. All the counsel of God. And not pluck some verse out of scripture and claim it to be the truth and nothing but the truth when we do not consider the whole testimony of the Lord God. In John chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 11, 15, 16, and 26 through 28. Verse 11, Christ says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 15, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Folks, do you think that might be the Gentiles? Not from the fold of, 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 of Jerusalem, or, or excuse me, the Jews? Them also I must bring and they will hear my voice. Now to verse 26. 
But you do not believe, and Christ is referring to the Jews, if you look up in verse 24. But you Jews do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Folks, how do we refute this language? I, I just don't know. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. He's repeating himself. And I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Christ died for sheep alone. The sheep alone receive eternal life. Christ did not die for goats. The goats do not receive eternal life. Check Matthew chapter 25 and you'll see that very, very plainly. The sheep are the elect of God. The goats are the reprobate, those who are rejected. Thanks be to God for purposing to save some and not to leave all alone to enjoy their sin for a season which results in eternal condemnation. And remember, the Bible is clear about the reprobate. When it comes to sin, the reprobate are those who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things, sin, are worthy of death, eternal death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. The King James says, have pleasure in them that do them. Folks, those who choose not to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's foolishness to them. They want to enjoy sin for a season. And they know the righteous judgment of God as the Bible says. Yet they go ahead doing these things and approving of those who practice them. And as it says earlier in the same chapter of the book of Romans, because I read that from Romans 132, as it says earlier, they are without excuse. They have no defense is another way to say that. We will deal with one more scripture today. Look at Hebrews 2.9. This is another really difficult one. What is the truth about Hebrews 2.9? Remember, folks, you've got to consider the whole counsel of God or you miss the boat. Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels... For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, listen, might taste death for every one. Folks, I can't change that. That's what it says. That he might taste death for every one. This is really not that difficult. It's very, very important to look up certain words, to understand what certain words mean. And of course, a key word here is taste. In this context, the word is referring to experiencing something. The lexicon makes that very clear as well. This Figurative language is used at least seven times 
in the King James Version of the New Testament concerning this Greek root word. Three of the gospel accounts record Christ saying to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some of you standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Humanity coming in his kingdom. Matthew 16, 28. Clearly, Christ is referring to experiencing death. In 1 Peter 2, 3, the apostle speaks of those who have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That simply means that they have experienced the grace of God. The death of Jesus Christ in his humanity. Please listen to me. The death of Jesus Christ in his humanity must have been experienced was required to be experienced by God in his humanity so that this human being who was raised from the dead might be Lord of all humanity. And by all humanity, we mean those who are alive together with Christ and those who remain dead in, uh, dead in trespasses. Yes, we're talking about everyone. The living and the dead, spiritually speaking. For to this end, this purpose, I'm quoting the Bible, for to this end, this purpose, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Did you hear that? Romans 14, 9. If you didn't hear it, I'm going to read it again. For to this end, this purpose, Christ died and rose and lived again. What was that purpose? That he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. And again, that's speaking of spiritually dead and spiritually living, Romans 14, 9. And moving forward a bit more in Romans 14, we read, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For, as, excuse me, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every e v e r y every knee shall bow to me and every every tongue shall confess to god the judgment seat of christ occurs when christ resurrects those who are alive spiritually and those who are dead spiritually he raises them from physical death they're either alive together with Christ or they're dead spiritually. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Philippians 2, 8 through 11. And being found in appearance as a human being, that's Jesus Christ, he humbled himself, having become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Because of his death, Christ has also exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone 
Christ experienced death for everyone that that might occur. To whom did God the Father give all authority over heaven and earth? In Matthew 28. The resurrected from the dead human being, yet God, Jesus Christ. In giving his perfect life as a sacrifice for the sins of God's elect people, the ex experience of that death also earned for Christ his lordship over all humanity, including his right to judge the living and the dead, those alive spiritually, those dead spiritually. Christ is a, an aroma of life unto life and death unto death. God the Father was so pleased, so satisfied with the death of his son that he raised him from the dead and made him Lord of all. Christ, now listen up. Listen to these two points. Christ's death was applied to the sins of God's elect people. Christ's death was experienced for everyone that he might be Lord of everyone. Those who are alive spiritually and those who are dead spiritually. Whether you are alive or dead spiritually, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Flee to Christ. Bow the knee. Flee to Christ. There is no other hope. Amen. Mercy.